pew, 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 pew. Oh, hi there. If you're like me and you like going fast and saving money, then let's go ahead and talk about some different cost optimizations you can make for your Kubernetes platform. So if you're just starting out with your Kubernetes platform and you want to start saving money, you got to do some monitoring. You know, the worst thing that you have to probably think about when you're actually doing something is setting up all the monitoring. What do I monitor? I don't know. How many clusters? How many workloads per cluster? But there's so much more that you have to monitor. So sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and actually go on and create things. And then with your cloud provider, you can monitor through billing and usage afterwards. So spend like crazy, start saving money and start deleting things and then start figuring out, you know, what do I actually need to do to not spend a fortune on Kubernetes? So on-prem, it may require some additional tooling like Prometheus or KubeCost. Some of the things that you can start doing after you're monitoring and figuring out what you're actually using to reduce costs are resource limits, auto-scaling, spot instances, multi-tenancy. So we're gonna get into some of those. We're gonna talk about them real quick. Uh, and then if you'd like, share some of your ideas on what you're doing to actually save money in Kubernetes. So resource limits, great place to start reducing costs. You can ensure that a single application or user cannot use excessive resources. So that user that's like, hey, give me 512 gigs for this pod. They may not be able to get it now, right? Cause you're like, nope, uh, upper limit's gonna be about like 32 or 16, but even that's probably a lot for what they're doing. Uh, make them justify what they're actually gonna be doing and then give them you know, limits that are actually within you know, what you can actually afford or within what's actually on the cluster. So your cluster may only have virtual machines that are 128 gigs of memory or even smaller if you're trying to take advantage of using smaller clusters uh, and packing more workloads on there. So uh, it's easier to predict usage when you add more resources if you're doing limits because you can say each team only gets a specific specific amount. If you're just letting everyone use whatever they want, then it's really hard to figure out like what kind of usage you're gonna have. So you can use resource quotas and you can use limit ranges. So you can set you know how much CPU, memory, or storage they can use and other things. And then you can set upper limits like we were talking about previously so someone doesn't ask for 512 gigs when they really don't need it. Uh, auto scaling. So pay for what you need instead of a static amount. Horizontal auto scaling is great because you can add or remove pods when the load is above or below a predefined threshold. Uh, it can be based on CPU or memory. And then vertical auto scaling is awesome too because you can scale the size of individual pods based on predefined thresholds. You can also resize in place using the vertical pod auto scaler. Uh, other tools like Knative can be used to scale to zero. So you can scale up and down based on usage. If you're not actually getting any requests in for your application, why run it, right? Like you can scale it to zero. And then when that request comes in, it says, hey, go create this for me. And then it'll serve up traffic to that pod when it comes up. What about discounted compute resources? So AWS spot instances, GCP preemptible VMs, and Azure spot VMs. Better for workloads that are ephemeral or need to burst to complete a task. They take advantage of the availability at scale when cloud providers are underutilized. So pay a lot less for something when you need it, when it's available. So. You can also do reserved instances. So you can do long-term discounts via commitments to specific periods. This is a little bit better of an option once you kind of have data on your usage and your needs. So once you've kind of been running for a little bit and you're like, okay, this is about how much I'm gonna need. I don't see huge growth within the next couple of months. Let me go ahead and get some reserved instances so I can pay a little bit less and say that I'm gonna be running this, you know, for the next six months or a year. Like you're, some of the downside is you're kind of locked in on that, but if you know that you're gonna be using this for a long period of time, then it's better to, to look at this instead of just saying, okay, let me just start creating things whenever whenever I need them. Uh, and then on-prem, you may use older hardware or something like that for a POC. Maybe you've got some hardware sitting around, you just wanna get stuff running. That's kinda gonna give you your discounted on-prem compute resources if you need it. And then multi-tenancy, this one's huge, right? So using a cluster for multiple users, tenants and applications, taking advantage of that one cluster and doing something like namespacing so that you can split everybody up. And then you can restrict users based on policies. Uh, and then vCluster, obviously Loft, this is one of our products that makes it super easy for multi-tenancy. You can separate workloads using namespaces and then go a little bit beyond and use virtual clusters, which will give you a separate API from the base cluster so you can install additional different versions of CRDs, create additional namespaces, and it spins up in a minute, right? So multi-tenancy is probably one of the easiest things that you can do to save money in Kubernetes. Uh, it's kind of like virtual machines on a piece of physical hardware, splitting it up, taking advantage of the fact that not everyone is going to be using all the resources all the time. Uh, and then there's other things you can use like sleep mode and some additional things to make it so that you can optimize even more. So what about after multi-tenancy? So let's say multi-tenancy can reduce costs and increase usage optimization. So it's great for users and teams, so tenants, great for applications, so dev, test, preview, and prod. And it reduces the need to deploy the same stack multiple times. So pack in more workloads to take advantage of the resources you're paying for. Right, so dev test preview, do you need a different cluster for each one of those? Not if you can do something like, you know, vCluster to deploy a new cluster with a new API endpoint and test new CRDs and then test things on the cluster and then quickly delete and get rid of them. 
like it's an ephemeral environment. But you could also run that in addition to production environments because you're you're just you're just going to be spinning up these ephemeral things for a little bit and getting rid of them. So they're not going to be using a ton of resources or maybe even interfere with your prod. Now sometimes you're going to have multiple clusters if you want to separate things out completely so that you have less you know points of failure. But something to think about when you're trying to just save costs, especially if you only have like, you know, a small application that's running and only serving up a little bit of stuff. Uh, and then you, you can combine this with auto scaling. You can even save more. Some workloads are not going to need to run for extended periods and are ephemeral. So scaling up by adding additional workers can also be faster than deploying a completely new cluster. So if you got ephemeral stuff, right? You can auto scale and say, okay, I've got all these ephemeral workloads that need to run. I need to scale up and get another worker node. That's gonna be a lot faster than deploying an entire cluster. Uh, you're just adding another worker to it and then you're deploying more pods on there. You might be able to add like some kind of like buffer zone to say, hey, when I have this many pods and I'm, I'm getting close to the the amount that I can actually run, go ahead and scale up another worker load and then put some of these new workloads there. Uh, and then, hey, if you're using something like a spot instance, you can save even more with that because you're just saying, hey, give me something super cheap. I'm going to run these workloads real quick and then I'm going to delete it. So uh, what's conclusion, right? Like so monitoring is a great place to start to figure out how much you're already spending. Multi-tenancy can reduce costs and cluster sprawl. And then there's a bunch of projects that are cloud native that can help you scale to zero, help with cost monitoring and help with multi-tenancy, even help you a little bit with the chargeback, which is pretty cool. Definitely avoid handing out an entire cluster to every user, right? So where do you go from here? Well, start monitoring, uh, start looking at multi-tenancy, look at stuff like namespacing. And then if you wanna go a little bit farther, look at uh, vCluster. Uh, and then after that, look at some other projects that may help you with these other things that you need to do and then avoid handing out a cluster to every user. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any suggestions on how you can save on Kubernetes platforms, let us know in the comments, right? Like, what are you doing to save money? Uh, are there some things that I missed here? Maybe I missed a couple of great ideas that you can share with the community, but uh, thanks for watching. Check out the description so you can see how to join our community and get started with vCluster today. Thanks, bye.